entitled Six Years After the Cuban Missile Crisis, Lessons for the 21st Century. For those of you who are loyal participants of these debates, please bury me. For those new to our discussions, please allow me to give you some background. The Geneva security debates are a series of public discussions which explore pressing and current security challenges. Every month, we bring together some of the world's leading thinkers, experts and practitioners for an interactive discussion on a specific challenge. In the short term, we hope that our Geneva security debates will help inform, provide new insights, stimulate joint reflections and facilitate networking for policymakers in Geneva uh, and uh, beyond. In the long term, uh, we hope that these debates will allow us to shape a better and a more peaceful global future for all of us. So why are we reflecting on the Cuban Missile Crisis today? The current escalation in Ukraine, accompanied by worrisome nuclear rhetoric, is arguably leading us closer to nuclear war than at any time since the Cuban Missile Crisis. And we need to move back from this brink. On the 16th of October 1962, the world was on the margin of a major atomic escalation. The only forces that could trigger and prevent such a disastrous escalation uh, back then were the two great powers, uh, the USSR and the United States of America. They eventually did prevent it through a negotiated compromise and cooperation. The crisis known in the West as the Cuban Missile Crisis and in Russia as the Caribbean Crisis may already seem like history, but I believe its lessons are today uh, more relevant than ever. Today, on the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, we invite you to pause and reflect on how humanity escaped a, a nuclear catastrophe. And we are delighted to have gathered here a panel of outstanding experts from the United States and the Russian Federation to uncover some lessons learned from managing this crisis and diffusing uh, a potential escalation. Allow me uh, to share just a, a couple of reflections of my own uh, at the outset uh, before we move into, uh, I'm confident, uh, a very stimulating and thought-provoking debate. As I was uh, alluding to before, one might be inclined uh, to perceive the current situation as worryingly familiar to the Cuban Missile Crisis. And indeed, we are facing again a major rift in the relations between Russia and the West. Yes, yet if we take a closer look, we recognize that the security landscape has changed dramatically uh, over the years. Let me uh, just mention some of the more evident differences. Six years ago, there were only four nuclear powers with heavy bilateral uh, tensions between two of them, the United States and the Soviet Union. However, the number of nuclear powers has increased and more than doubled uh, since. So in a way, uh, we have moved from a bipolar to a multipolar security environment. While I would acknowledge that the bulk of nuclear weapons still is with the United States and the Russian Federation, and thereby also the political responsibility that goes with it. Six years ago, the crisis transformed into the first peak of an unfolding arms race. At, a, at that time, there were no fundamental arms control mechanism to regulate states' behavior in the nuclear sphere. Since then, the Cuban Missile Crisis has incited significant international efforts to reduce nuclear arms proliferation and to reduce uh, 
atomic supplies. Examples include the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, International Atomic Agency's efforts, the Compre Comprehensive uh, Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, and uh, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, just to name a few. Still, today, in this highly polarized environment, characterized by a deep lack of trust among key security stakeholders, we have been witnessing the gradual unraveling of the arms control system that has provided us with relative stability for quite a while. 60 years ago, the security landscape was clear, simpler to understand. Today, security threats have become increasingly obscure, complex, transnational. Traditional concepts, including this famous concept of mutually assured destruction, are challenged by rapidly developing cyber and artificial intelligence technologies. Moreover, trust in multilateral institutions and mechanisms is uh, being undermined amidst the nuclear threat we face. Today, the doctrine of deterrence again dominates the European security order practically exclusively. Defense budgets are on a steep increase, taking us most likely to another arms race in the conventional and perhaps also nuclear fields. The concept dear to me of cooperative security is totally marginalized. Today, no one wants to speak of dialogue, no one wants to speak of detente. That there is no business as usual with a war at the heart of Europe seems quite normal to me. But that doesn't, that shouldn't mean no business at all. On the contrary, we cannot afford to be frozen at a time when our security environment is so fluid. What remains crucial and identical, ladies and gentlemen, to the situation 60 years ago is the importance of maintaining channels of communication open and fostering dialogue. Fostering dialogue among diplomats, among militaries, among academics uh, and uh, the civil society. And that is what we are trying to do here at the GCSB. Guided by the principles of impartiality, independence, and inclusivity, we bring together like-minded and non-like-minded individuals to meet, to share their views on complex issues, aiming at fostering a greater, greater mutual understanding and ideally also uh, cooperation. As such, we are not here to promote any specific policy choice or geopolitical alignment but to offer this safe space to you to contribute uh, uh, your ideas, your insights to a timely debate needed in our joint pursuit for peace uh, on our continent. In this spirit, I invite you to immerse yourself in, into today's Geneva security debate with an open mind and share your thoughts and questions, uh, uh, including after uh, the panel discussion. Already uh, at this point, I would like to thank you for your valuable insights, for your contributions during uh, today's timely event. And now, without the further ado, I would like the hand to hand the floor over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Christina Shori Lang. She's senior advisor uh, uh, of our research and policy advice department. She's going to introduce uh, our speakers and she will moderate the panel discussion. Over to you, Christina, and thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Greminger, for your welcome address and for underlining the importance of making this event constructive and forward looking. We are indeed in a safe place here at the GCSP in Geneva, Switzerland. Excellencies, minist ministers, ladies and gentlemen, we are indeed honored to see so many of you here today in this room. We have about 90 people here in the room and another 90 people online.
Six years ago, in the depths of the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union came closer to nuclear war than ever before during the 13 days of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The crisis was set off by the Soviet decision to station ballistic missiles in Cuba far too close for the United States' comfort. Despite miscommunication and mixed messages, President John F. Kennedy and Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev ultimately negotiated their way back from the brink of nuclear Armageddon. The Soviets pulled their nuclear-capable missiles out of Cuba and in kind the United States subsequently and quietly pulled its nuclear capable missiles out of Turkey. However, the Cuban Missile Crisis is often credited with jumpstarting US Soviet arms control. Indeed, the five years from 1963 to 1968 were constructive, yielding the hotline agreement, the limited test ban treaty, the outer space treaty, and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. This Monday, the 17th of October, NATO launched its annual nuclear exercise, Steadfast Noon, practicing the handling of non-strategic nuclear weapons and aircraft from more than half a dozen NATO countries over the skies of Belgium, the United Kingdom, and the North Sea. Security experts are also expecting Russia to practice the deployment of strategic nuclear forces during its annual Grom Thunder exercise along Russia's northwestern coast. These exercises happen every year, and officials insist they are not directly linked to any current world events. Except this year, they are happening during the time of one of the worst NATO-Russia crises since the Cold War. At the same time, for the this under, to underline the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, anti-nuclear activists have gathered worldwide, demanding that global leaders defuse the threat of nuclear war. We too have gathered today before you a distinguished panel with, which represent our GCSP principles of inclusivity and impartiality. Two Russians and two Americans who have collectively contributed greatly to building global knowledge on disarmament and arms control issues, and have not only helped to inform the next generation of experts in the field, but have been powerful disarmament advocates for decades, and are thus especially well-versed in addressing our Geneva security debate topic, 60 years of the Cuban Missile Crisis, lessons for the 21st century. Let me first begin by introducing our panelists and then describe how our debate will unfold. Dr. Vladimir Orlov, founder and director of the Moscow Peer Center and founder and president of the Trilogue International Club, as well as professor at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations, the MGIMO, as well as a member of the UN General Advisory Board on Disarmament Matters for several years. He is the author of multiple books and articles that have helped shape and train the next generation of disarmament experts. Sarah Bidgood, she wears multiple hats. She is the director of the Eurasian Non-Proliferation non Program at the James Martin Center for Non-Proliferation non Studies in Monterey, California. She is also an adjunct professor at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. Her research focuses on U.S.-Soviet and U.S.-Russian non-proliferation and arms con co control cooperation. And she's also the author of multiple books and articles of greatly, as well as uh, authored uh, in many articles. Dr. William Potter is the director of the James Martin Center for Non-Proliferation Studies and Professor of Non-Proliferation Studies at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. He is also the author and editor of over a dozen books and one of a handful of scholars, knowledge of both Soviet affairs and the dangers and spread of nuclear weapons. Um, he has taken this knowledge of after the collapse of the Soviet Union to discuss the spread of the nuclear weapons and helped create the Center for Non-Proliferation Studies, our partner today. 
it is one of the largest research and training centers focused on preventing the spread of weapons of mass destruction worldwide. Dr. Elena Chernenko is a special correspondent of the Commerçant Publishing House and co-chair of the Trilog Club International. She has a history a degree PhD in her pocket from the Moscow State University and has been working as a journalist for the German desk as well as the broadcast host for Russia's government's radio broadcasting service Voice of Russia. She has also been a correspondent for the newspaper Moscow Deutscher Zeitung and the wire service Euer Aktiv as well as the magazine Russian Newsweek. She is also a member of the executive board of the Peer Center. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Christina Shori Liang. I lead the research and policy advice uh, work here at the center focusing on terrorism, PV, and organized crime. I'm also an adjunct professor at the Paris School of International Affairs, Sciences Po. Our debate will con consist of three parts. First, uh, each panelist will be asked to reflect on four important questions. First, what were some of the underlying and in immediate causes of the October 1962 crisis? What factors made it possible to avert nuclear war? And what are the similarities and differences between the crisis in 1962 and today? What lessons have we grasped from the Cuban Missile Crisis that are applicable to the current security context today? So each panelist has given will be given a chance to speak they will offer their own perspectives and opinions and then i will take back the floor so dr orlov uh, you have the floor please address these questions for us we look forward to your presentation yes good afternoon uh Hey, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I feel very homey at GCSP, where I spent a few years. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Christina, for so uh, nicely leading us and uh, introducing us. Probably been feeling that homey at the GCSP. I shaped my uh, remarks. Uh, more as a personal rather than systemic research or uh, academic uh, ones. And uh, there is a certain reason to that. I was a boss to Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev, and I had Fidel Castro as a friend. Needless to say, Nikita was a grandson of the Soviet ex-leader, and Fidelito was a son of Cuban leader. Both were exciting interlocutors to discuss the history of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, as they shared with me a lot of uh, details of what they learned from their parents and grandparents, I always uh, was dreaming one day of bringing them together at the conference panel. Unfortunately, both of my friends passed away. But what we discussed with them as history today, 60 years ago, Ambassador Greminger, Thomas, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, today uh, is not only history. It really knocks our door. Don't some history pages rhyme with current uh, events and current uh, global uh, debates. In my remarks, uh, I will share with you what the lessons I have learned, and not only of the crisis itself, but also of its aftershock for the last six decades. Uh, I myself have learned quite a few, but today, with your permission, I will limit myself only to five lessons. And for that, I need not only this PowerPoint, but also to put you in a time machine. And now we uh, travel to... Uh, of course, 1962. Basically, I was looking what really had happened on that particular day 60 years ago uh, to find my first lesson. And I was digging deep uh, into uh, the uh, uh, Russian and uh, American uh, archives, not all of them, but most of them. Uh, are now uh, available 
someone left you the kids uh, after what uh, had happened. The fourth day of the crisis, uh, 19 uh, October 62, was not uh, the worst day. The worst would be later. Uh, but it was on that particular day when an invasion to Cuba and an attack of Soviet missile sites turned out to be a preferred option of GFK's advisors. Uh, and when I read that cables uh, of that particular day from Washington, but also from Moscow, uh, I noticed and compared them, I noticed how hugely both sides misinterpreted intentions of each other, though they presumed they still talk to each other. And this brings me to my lesson number one. Lack of informal communication between the two parties in the times of a crisis leads to dramatic and dangerous misinterpretations and misperceptions. And this is a direct risk to slide down to war because there is no dialogue or because a dialogue is inefficient. Now with my time machine, we travel into 1968, an interesting year. Uh, anyway, uh, the year produced a great post-Cuban crisis fruit. And our Madam Chi already mentioned that. Signing of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT. Uh, after both Soviet Union and the United States felt uh, they were so close to the nuclear war. Ideas of controlling proliferation of nuclear weapons received support on the top political level, both in Washington and in Moscow. And this, exactly this, hugely facilitated the work of the diplomats. And less than six years after the crisis, we got the NPT, which is with us uh, indefinitely. Uh, this brings me to my lesson number two. Nuclear crisis can open doors, can also open doors to nuclear agreements, new nuclear agreements and treaties, which make world more secure, pushing the leaders towards it. If, of course, the leaders do learn from the crisis themselves and are wise enough to re-energize diplomacy with an, with an opponent, not skip it. But on the same year, and uh, I do not forget uh, that this is the same slide, uh, the same year gives a very different, another lesson. It was the year when the United States seriously were planning the use of tactical nuclear weapons in a regional conflict in Vietnam. Finally, it did not happen, as we know. But it could happen, and as we see from the documents, it could happen in 1968 and not only then. This is my lesson number three. Temptations of use of nuclear weapons are sometimes there when there is even no global nuclear crisis. And there is an illusion of a possibility of so-called limited nuclear war, which they think can be won. It is a dangerous illusion. There will be no winners in the nuclear war. And now my time machine brings us not that far away from now, uh, 2012, uh, 50 years uh, after the Cuban Missile Crisis and 10 uh, years back uh, from now. On that year, and I told you it would be personal. Uh, on that year, I was asked to write an essay for one of our leading magazines, Oganyok, about the same topic as we discussed today, lessons learned. I worked then with the Cuban archives and looked at the side of the story through the Cuban lens. Yes, we should not forget that the 1962 crisis was not exactly a tango for two. There were others involved. And of course, when we say that the origin of the crisis were Soviet uh, missiles uh, sent to Cuba, this is not right. The root causes were different. Uh, 
Turkish missiles, uh, American missiles in Turkey and uh, American attempts to uh, invade Cuba, which Soviet Union decided to uh, to protect. Mm, anyway, this was not a tango for two, or was it? Although 2012 was already a year of very difficult relations and aggravating uh, relations and tensions between Russia and the United States. And that article, which I published 10 years ago, I came to a conclusion that may sound paradoxical, which I put uh, in uh, the title, which you can see uh, now on this uh, screen. And uh, basically... My conclusion was that the Russians and Americans, if the business is getting really serious, will come to an agreement without witnesses, without reflecting or betraying their friends or so-called friends. After all, such concepts as friends have no place in today's international relations, just that they had no place half a century ago. Interest determine everything and can can there be a stronger interest than survival? But I can imagine this may be a challenging statement, so please do not hesitate to uh, to challenge me here. And uh, actually, after this uh, both lesson, my travel, uh, my uh, time machine will go back in time. And now we are in the 1960, two years before the Cuban, uh, before the Cuban Missile uh, Crisis, but this will be the final stop. And on the picture, the guy is Leo Szilard, a famous Hungarian turned US a nuclear scientist who worked on the bomb and soon became disappointed and started his energetic and partly eccentric nuclear disarmament uh, campaign. And uh, what you see here on the screen, at least partly what you see here, are um, fragments from his uh, uh, story or pamphlet, which is called The Voice of the Dolphins. And uh, he was so frustrated with the dangers of the uh, sliding to the dangers of nuclear war in the 1960s that he decided uh, that the rational arguments are inefficient. And so he chose others. And he told this story beginning in 1960 and ending in 1985, in which a delegation of dolphins intervened to reverse the nuclear arms race where human beings had failed. Leo sent a Russian translation to the Soviet premier, Nikita Khrushchev, who agreed to meet privately in October 1960 in New York. The meeting scheduled for 15 minutes extended into a two-hour uh, discussion on how to prevent or at least de-escalate a nuclear war including Sillard's suggestion to establish an open telephone line between the Kremlin in Moscow, in Moscow and the White House in Washington, D.C. Sillard presented his guest with a chic injector razor and a six-month supply of blades, promising to send more as long as the United States and the USSR avoided war. Khrushchev accepted the razor, adding that Quote, if there is a war, he will stop shaving, and he thinks that most other people will stop shaving also. Khrushchev offered a case of vodka in return, but Sillard, suffering from bladder cancer, asked for mineral water instead. Two cases, along with caviar and the smoked fish, were delivered to his room. Sillard kept his promise, replenishing the supply of razor blades until in the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the channels of communication were uh, interrupted. And here I come to my final conclusion and my final fifth lesson. Dolphins will not help, very unlikely. As my teacher, 
And that's the Roland Timirbay, one of the authors of the NPT, used to tell me, Volodya, full responsibility is only ours of this human race. If we are not wise, then razors will not be needed and vodka will not help. As this human race will be erased and probably replaced by a new one, hopefully a wiser one. Thank you for your attention. Dr. Olaf, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Professor Bidgood, please uh, tell us a, about the difference and the similarities between the Cuban Missile Crisis and the present moment and um, how this will impact arms control in the future. We look forward to hearing your thoughts. Uh, thank you so much, Christina, and thank you to the GCSP. It's really a pleasure to be here, and um, I'm so delighted to have the chance to meet you guys in person. Um, so the topic that we're, of course, here to discuss is the Cuban Missile Crisis and the lessons that it offers for us in the 21st century. So with this in mind, what I thought I would do is take up some of the questions that we've been offered and to share my own views about what I see as the dissimilarities and the parallels between the present, present crisis, the war in Ukraine, and what was happening 60 years ago at this time. And then in keeping with the focus of my own work, I'm going to outline what I think we can expect for the future of U.S. and Russian arms control on the basis of some of these observations. So I'll start by making sort of an obvious observation, which is that the war in Ukraine has drawn frequent comparisons to the events of October of 1962 since it started. Um, President Biden recently noted some of these parallels himself earlier this month when he observed that we have not faced the prospect of Armageddon since Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis. But if we look a little bit below the surface, which is what I hope to do here, we can see that there are some important ways in which these two events are actually dissimilar from one another. Some of the ones that I think are the most important relate to the nature of these crises themselves, the timelines along which they're occurring, and the context in which they're taking place. So with respect to the first of these, I think it's really useful, and I promise I will not go into a long diatribe about sort of um, IR theory here, but I think it's very useful to look at the work of Mark Bell and Julia McDonald, who have presented an interesting framework for categorizing different kinds of nuclear crises by type. And what we find when we do that is that both the Cuban Missile Crisis and the war in Ukraine do fit this definition of a nuclear crisis, but they each represent different models within this typology that they develop. So the Cuban Missile Crisis, in their view, is sort of a canonical example of a brinkmanship crisis. That's one that, and I'm going to quote them here, is characterized by limited incentives to use nuclear weapons first and low levels of controllability. But the war in Ukraine is a little bit different. That looks more to me and to many others like a stability and stability crisis, which occurs when you've got relative strategic stability between nuclear adversaries that allows lower level or conventional conflict to erupt. Now, I'm not citing this typology to predict anything about how I think the war in Ukraine will end or the probability that nuclear weapons are going to be used or won't be used in that particular context. I think doing that would require making assumptions about nuclear decision making and maybe even the immutability of crisis type that I'm not really prepared to do without further evidence. But what I do want to underscore with this example is that the Cuban Missile Crisis and the war in Ukraine at this stage are not, it seems to me, the same kind of nuclear crisis. And what that tells me is that we need to be a little bit cautious about using the former of these to predict anything about the latter. Okay, so this brings me to the second difference that I see between the Cuban Missile Crisis and the present day, which has to do with the timeline along which each is unfolding. So although the Cuban Missile Crisis lasted quite a bit longer than the 13 days on which we, we tend to focus in sort of popular discourse, it didn't last for eight months with no discernible end in sight, which is really where we find ourselves today. And I point this out because I think the duration of the present conflict matters in important ways. It means that policymakers and officials in both Russia and the West have more opportunities to adjust their perceptions of risk as this war drags on. And what that means in practice, at least to me, is that their perceptions of what kinds of behaviors are risky also can change too. Now, I don't think that we should interpret these shifts as evidence that anything has actually changed with respect to the actual risk of escalation in this crisis. Instead, I think when we observe these, they show from a behavioral economics perspective how our different points of reference have changed over the course of this war. So with that in mind, I would actually argue that the longer time frame of the current crisis makes it more dangerous, perhaps, than the Cuban Missile Crisis. It gives us more time to edge down what Thomas Schelling described as that curved slope towards nuclear war without necessarily being aware of how far we've gone down that slope. 
So the third difference that I would point to between the Cuban Missile Crisis and today is the state of engagement between Washington and Moscow when it comes to nuclear issues. So I'll hearken to something that Ambassador Graminger said in his opening comments. Um, prior to October of 1962, the two sides were actively engaged in negotiations with one another on arms control efforts. And um, despite significant, significant differences in their opinions, they managed to continue these negotiations for quite some time. A major focus of those efforts, which ultimately did end up bearing fruit, was on concluding a nuclear test ban, where talks had been ongoing really since the 1950s. Another priority where progress was a bit harder to come by was on advancing the idea of general and complete disarmament, which was in keeping with an ambitious program that the United States and the Soviet Union had adopted here in Geneva in 1961. Things obviously looked very different in the lead up to the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February of this year. Although the two sides did have one arms control agreement in place, which is still in place, that's New START, it's not really clear what the future of that agreement is going to look like beyond its expiration in 2026. Presidents Biden and Putin, as we know, did initiate this strategic stability dialogue in 2021, and this was charged with laying the groundwork for subsequent arms control and risk reduction measures. But we also know that significant disagreements remained at that time over their scope and the focus of those measures. And as of today, that means that the two sides haven't really engaged in formal arms control negotiations since the conclusion of New START in 2010, which is quite a long time. So to me, those three differences point to some limitations of the Cuban Missile Crisis as an historical analog for the present moment. They suggest that we need to be pretty cautious about attempting to use it as a template for policy prescription today. But at the same time, if we step back, we can also see some broader parallels between the war in Ukraine and what was happening 60 years ago. And without overdrawing what those similarities are, I think these can and should inform our expectations specifically about what to expect with respect to nuclear arms control. So that's where I'm going to turn now. OK, so what are some of these parallels? Um, the first that I see between these two events is their perceived significance as inflection points in history. In today's context, I would argue that much of the international community recognizes the war in Ukraine as a watershed. The Cuban Missile Crisis was similarly seen as a pivotal moment in history, both by contemporaries and by later observers. So as John F. Kennedy said uh, famously on October 22nd of 1962, this secret, swift, and extraordinary buildup of communist missiles is a deliberately provocative and unjustified change in the status quo that cannot be accepted by this country. Within scholarship, this event has been called things like the Gettysburg of the Cold War, a major watershed, um, one hell of a gamble. Um, much like the war today, there's little question, there was little question then that this crisis represented a dangerous moment in relations between the two largest nuclear weapon states. Okay, so this brings me to the second parallel that I want to highlight, which relates to the narratives that are then built around significant events like these and the manner in which they are influenced um, and interpreted by policymakers on all sides. So, and as was the case with the Cuban Missile Crisis, I think we can realistically expect the war in Ukraine to reinforce rather than change existing beliefs about the utility of nuclear weapons and the importance of arms control. I say this because we can already see this happening in public discourse, at least, you know, in my country. As some in the nuclear optimist camp have argued, the potential use of nuclear weapons in Ukraine points to the need for more capabilities that could be used for so-called escalation management. And among those who are sort of in the nuclear pessimist camp, the potential for miscalculation and misinterpretation that comes with this conflict underscores the need to advance nuclear disarmament and risk reduction more urgently. Determining which of these camps is going to have the more significant impact on policy, I think, will probably depend on perceptions around the outcome of this war itself. And we don't, of course, know what those are going to be. But in the context of the Cuban Missile Crisis, William J. Perry, who is our former Secretary of Defense, has actually linked the acceleration of the arms race that followed to the narrative that Kennedy's nuclear deterrent is what forced Khrushchev to back down. Much later, interestingly enough, President Ronald Reagan also cited Kennedy's you know, victory to support the major military buildup that he initiated during his first term in office. And as he observed at that time, the United States had about an eight to one nuclear superiority over the Soviet Union. So when we stood up and looked them in the eye, they blinked. But even if the voices of the nuclear pessimists were somehow to prevail today over those of the optimists, it's not really clear to me if or when the United States and Russia would be prepared to come to the negotiating table or what we could expect the outcome of those negotiations to be. And that leads me to the third and final parallel that I'm going to highlight here, um, which relates to the impact of emotions on arms control outcomes. 
So we know that for good faith negotiations to be effective, the two sides are going to need to have a level of trust that unfortunately I expect will be missing from U.S. and Russian Russian relations for quite some time. At this point in the war, it's very clear that the mutual acrimony and suspicion that already characterized these interactions has grown deeper. And I think it's unlikely that those feelings are just going to dissipate automatically once the war itself ends. And I say this in part because we saw something similar happen after the Cuban Missile Crisis, when you had a period of mutual suspicion and mistrust that lasted well after Khrushchev withdrew withdrew those missiles from Cuba. As Kennedy indicated again in December of 1962, he perceived his counterpart's actions in the, Carib- in the Caribbean to be an effort to materially change the balance of power, and he thought it would be some time before it would be possible to come to any kind of real understandings with Mr. Khrushchev. So as a result of this, progress on nuclear arms control became almost impossible for eight months after the crisis itself ended. And by the spring of 1963, these U.S. and Soviet talks on a comprehensive nuclear test ban that I had mentioned were completely stalled. Now, the big issue, which I think is instructive for us, that the two sides couldn't resolve at that time had to do with verification and what constituted an adequate on-site inspection regime. So for President Kennedy, having sufficient on-site inspections was essential to ensuring that he had domestic political support for a ban on underground testing. But for Khrushchev, these felt like a pretext for spying on Soviet activities. I suspect that there's going to be a similar fixation on so-called ironclad verification that follows the end of the war in Ukraine. And I think that could have the the potential to further lessen prospects for reaching an agreement at a times when the arms control architecture is already quite impoverished. So one possible note of optimism as I wrap up here in this otherwise gloomy landscape that I've painted is that high-level institutional advocacy at a presidential level has historically gone a very long way towards overcoming the kinds of challenges that I've just been describing here. And fittingly enough for our purposes, um, one of the, the clearest and most significant examples of this actually comes from the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis. In June of 1963, President Kennedy delivered, as many of you know, the commencement address at American University. And he used this as an opportunity to declare that he would not be the first to resume atmospheric testing, and he called for a fresh start on nuclear test ban negotiations. A month later, Khrushchev agreed to negotiate a limited test ban with no on-site inspections, which was a concession that he previously had not been open to making. Correspondingly, by July 25th of 1963, the two sides had concluded an agreement that wasn't comprehensive, but it still represented a really significant contribution to both non-proliferation and arms control. Now, what I don't know, of course, in our in our current context, and I don't think anyone in this room knows this, is whether and when there will be um, sufficient political will on either side for the kinds of efforts that I was just describing. You know, the strategic stability dialogue uh, remains paused, and there's no real indication of when that's going to resume. So for this and all of the reasons that I've just been describing here, I think we need to resist the urge to assume that something like that very fruitful period of U.S. and Soviet arms control that followed the Cuban Missile Crisis will emerge automatically after the war in Ukraine ends. And instead, what I think we ought to be doing in the expert community and in the diplomatic community is working hard to develop proposals that policymakers can act on uh, when the time is right. So I'll leave it here. Thanks, Christina. Thank you so much for that extremely rich um, and detailed presentation. One word that that stood out was trust, and I think it was it was a wonderful word because it it was actually the word that that uh, we finalized at the art of diplomacy that that started this whole Geneva security debate with Ambassador Wolfgang Ischinger and Ambassador Thomas Gramminger. The importance of trust, how quickly you 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 can lose trust, and how important it is in the art of diplomacy. So thank you so much for highlighting that. I am now going to pass the floor to Dr. Potter, who is also going to address those four questions that we have uh, raised uh, for the debate. I very much look forward to your remarks. The floor is yours. Uh, Thank you very much, Christina. Is this on? Can you hear me? Okay, very good. So I I should begin probably by saying uh, uh, in a form of a confession uh, that I feel very much like an imposter at at this session. Although I could readily provide some probably um, provocative remarks about uh, the recent NPT review conference that was held uh, in New York, and I could talk on a number of other topics with at least some uh, semblance of authority. Uh, I feel out of place speaking at a meeting focused on the Cuban Missile Crisis, because unlike a number of uh, scholars in the room whom I see, I see Tom and Svetlana here, and I think Michael Dobbs is, is watching us from afar, um, 
uh, who are true scholars of the crisis, and a number of other individuals, such as Linton Brooks, who I see in our room here, and I think uh, uh, we have General Yesen uh, also uh, uh, engaged virtually from Moscow, who were actual participants at a young age uh, in the crisis. Uh, my connection is much more uh, tangential. Um, what I do recall uh, is uh, having a very deeply ingrained uh, memory of a close call uh, when I was a teenager. Um, I recall uh, having interacted in later years with some of the principals on the U.S. side, including uh, Secretary McNamara and uh, Kennedy's speechwriter Ted Sorensen. And uh, it was certainly the case that I helped to make Harvard professor uh, Graham Allison uh, a wealthy man, at least by university faculty standards, uh, by requ requiring thousands of my students over the years uh, to read his pathbreaking uh, 1971 book, es Essence of Decision, explaining the Cuban Missile uh, Crisis. But I can probably best contribute to our discussion this afternoon is to raise some of the questions that I would hope the true scholars uh, among us today uh, can help us answer. I'll also suggest some of the factors that, as best I can discern, contributed to the avoidance of nuclear war 60 years ago. So uh, what's new uh, and what's true? Uh, we certainly know a lot more about the circumstances surrounding the Cuban Missile Crisis today and the manner in which it unfolded than we did in the 1960s, the 1970s, and 1980s, uh, during which time there was certainly no shortage of uh, biographies, autobiographies, uh, scholarly accounts, journalistic accounts of the 13 days uh, in October. By the end of the 1980s, one also could draw upon insights from several conferences that brought together both U.S. and Soviet officials. Uh, and then if we fast forward to the 1990s and the first two decades of the 2000s, <clears throat> we can point to another wave of publications uh, that certainly enhanced our understanding of the conflict, uh, uh, in part because of the workshops that uh, Tom and, and uh, uh, Svetlana organized that brought together key U.S., American, and Cuban policymakers and scholars, uh, as well as from access to declassified tape recordings of the Executive Committee of the U.S. National Security Council meetings, and new archival material from Russian government sources. Among the most interesting and influential publications from this period are the Fersenko and Naftali uh, book, uh, One Hell of a Gamble, uh, the 2009 uh, book by Michael Dobbs, One Minute to Midnight, uh, and Sergo Bikoyan's uh, study of the Soviet Cuban Missile Crisis is edited by Svetlana as it depicts in a very, very uh, fascinating fashion, the aftermath of the crisis, which tends to be little known to casual observers, but also had the potential to escalate in a very unpredictable uh, fashion. My purpose in referencing these studies is to suggest that although the literature on the Cuban Missile Crisis is enormous, it's also very uneven, consisting overwhelmingly of Western analyses. Moreover, despite the volume of publications, a number of important questions remain unanswered, including those regarding the motivations of key individuals and government actors, the rationality of the decision-making process, the nature of risks involved, and the degree to which they were recognized at the time by key decision-makers, the reasons for intelligence failures before and during the crisis, and the mechanisms by which the crisis ultimately was resolved. More specifically, how close were we to the use of nuclear weapons? What were the most dangerous moments of the crisis? What was the nature of the Cuban-Russian debate both during and after the crisis? And was there ever a potential for Castro to initiate a nuclear exchange? What role did luck play uh, in avoiding nuclear weapons use? Which among the different explanations offered uh, by scholars and uh, practitioners as motivations for Khrushchev's decision to, to deploy nuclear weapons in Cuba 
best uh, explain the deployment decision. Uh, and these motivations include a desire to offset the Jupiter missiles deployed by the U.S. and Turkey, a feeling of both personal and national insecurity vis-a-vis -vis the United States, a desire to demonstrate resolve in defending a Cuban ally, and perhaps also the perceived need to fend off Chinese accusations of weakness and a lack of revolutionary vigor. How much opposition did Khrushchev face from his military and other Politburo members? Was Mikoyan a lone voice of caution? What does the Soviet decision to place missiles in Cuba and the U.S. response tell us about risk-taking behavior related to nuclear conflict? How risky did key U.S. and Russian decision makers believe their actions were? What, if anything, have U.S. and Russian leaders learned from histories of the Cuban Missile Crisis? And are current leaders any less predisposed than their predecessors to gamble recklessly with nuclear threats and red lines? What new insights have emerged during the past decade that alter our understanding of the dynamics of the crisis in October 62? And what archival materials, especially in Russia and Cuba, but also in the United States, remain off limits to scholars. Let me conclude my prepared remarks by pointing to some lessons that I derive from my admittedly limited familiarity with the Cuban Missile Crisis. First, uh, if there's a single lesson that I believe should be learned from the Cuban Missile Crisis, it's the need for both US and Russian leaders to be highly skeptical of their own ability to assess accurately their capabilities and those of their adversary, and most importantly, their ability to exercise control over events as they play out in the field. This is particularly relevant uh, to the dangers of escalation during a crisis due to the potential loss of control by the political leadership over at least some aspects of their military machines. As Michael Dobbs points out in his masterful study, Kennedy was aware of this danger in 1962, as he had read Barbara Tuckman's account of the origins of uh, the First World War, the Guns of August, and appreciated how mistakes and misunderstandings can unleash an unpredictable chain of events leading states to go to war with little appreciation of the unintended consequences of their decisions. It's a lesson that Presidents Putin and Biden would be wise to recall as they contemplate next moves in the grueling war in Ukraine. Very relevant to this issue, in my view, are the very different life experiences of Kennedy and Khrushchev and their contemporary counterparts. Perhaps most importantly, both Kennedy and Khrushchev, unlike Biden and Putin, had experienced war firsthand and were dis disinclined to believe much of what they were told by their military advisors, who tended to be overconfident and routinely exaggerated the benefits and min minimized the costs of risk-taking. Second point has to do with ambitious, or rather ambiguous signals and incomplete information and intelligence. One reason for the need to resist hasty decisions is the difficulty of distinguishing signals from noise. As Roberta Wolstetter persuasively argues in her 1965 comparison of U.S. intelligence shortcomings in Pearl Harbor and Cuba, what becomes clear after the fact often is ambiguous during an approaching crisis, regardless of the technical capabilities at one's disposal. In addition, one often tends to overestimate the clarity of one's own signals and the certainty with which one interprets the intent of those sent by an adversary. Probably most difficult to calculate during the crisis, but critical to its peaceful resolution, is a correct assessment of the risk-taking behavior and psychological makeup of the adversary. An accurate assessment is apt to depend on both relatively objective criteria, including capabilities, but also less tangible factors involving personal attributes, motivations, the nature of the process by which decisions are made, the importance of the stakes in question for both parties, one's faith in the reliable operation of technology and the performance of large, large organizations, 
and perceptions about the costs of inaction. If I'm correct in my assessment, it is vital that policymakers should be humble in their ability to predict the behavior of the other side and very skeptical of those who speak confidently about their ability to do so. What worries me today is the prominence given to some commentators, particularly in my view in Russia, who purport to know how the U.S. will respond to nuclear threats, but probably have little basis for their expectations. The corollary of this lesson is the need for empathy and a deep understanding of the political and military culture of the adversary. A crisis often is defined as a situation in which decision makers have little time to respond to high threats to core interests. While the discovery by the U.S. of Soviet missiles in Cuba was undoubtedly perceived by U.S., Soviet, and Cuban decision makers as posing high risks to all concerned, U.S. decision makers were fortunate to have considerable time to debate the merits of alternative approaches. To some extent, this was due to the failure of U.S. intelligence to recognize the scope of nuclear weapons deployments in Cuba and their readiness for use. Regardless, the U.S. XCOM had the opportunity to engage in extensive debates about an appropriate U.S. response, discussions that led to the debunking of some of the most dangerous options that were initially proposed, including an airstrike and an invasion. By the same token, as best I can tell from secondary sources, scholars believe that Khrushchev also moderated his risk-taking inclinations over the course of the crisis, including with respect to the delegation of control over the launching of nuclear weapons. In other words, time is a precious commodity and may be a necessary, if not a sufficient condition for prudent, prudent policy decisions. My fourth and final cautionary note with regards to historical lessons is that learning is not unidirectional in the sense that the more leaders believe they know, they know the more prudent their policies will be. In fact, some analysts appear to have learned the faulty lesson from the Cuban Missile Crisis that resolve automatically deters unwanted behavior while hesitation begets it. The myth also has arisen that because nuclear arms control and the control occurred in the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis, that we should look forward to a new arms control renaissance if and when we survive the current crisis in U.S.-Russian relations. I see little evidence for that optimistic assessment, especially given the total absence of trust and respect and empathy that characterizes our current relationship, characteristics that will be very difficult to restore. So let me conclude my remarks on a personal note. While I was not deployed in the theater as were General Yeson and Linton Brooks 60 years ago, I do still vividly recall leaving for school every day during the Cuban Missile Crisis and wondering if the world uh, were about to end. It was the time when Bobby Kennedy would recall that World War III would be fought with atomic weapons and the next war with sticks and stones. It's my hope that during our workshop in Geneva, we'll learn more about the factors that enabled us to avoid Armageddon 60 years ago and what must be done today to ensure that future scholars and diplomats will be able to return to Geneva for another conference on the 100th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Potter. I'm now going to uh, Give the floor to uh, Dr. Chernenko. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, thoughts on the four questions that we have posed to you. Thank you very much, uh, Christina. Um, you see, I'm the only one in the panel not having any prepared notes, and that's for a reason. I knew that my highly knowledgeable panelists will have said everything important uh, before me. So I would only uh, be able to um, add something that hasn't been said here. And I would like to do so with something which was most familiar to me as a journalist. Um, that's the public um, awareness angle. Um, that's one of the differences that I notice when looking at the events of today and of the events of 60 years ago. 
um, because uh, before coming here to this uh, session today, I looked at how um, the U.S. press back then uh, wrote about whatever happened in the in those days and how it was in the Soviet Union. And I was amazed to see that while, as Dr. Potter said, even school children were aware of what was happening during these times, the Soviet public was for a very long time uh, basically unaware at how close the world has come to a catastrophe. Um, it was informed about some of the decisions that have been taken by the leaders, but only much later learned about uh, what a catastrophe this all could have been. Today, um, the situation could not be more different. Uh, we see that all around the world, not only in the US, in Russia, in Ukraine, um, in Europe, people basically follow um, and wait for every statement of uh, officials, of diplomats. Um, they watch every news on any practical steps uh, having to do with nukes. Um, for one part of the journalist, I'm happy to, about that because we never had such uh, high readerships on things that I cover for many years. And I'm writing about arms control and non-proliferation for the general public for quite a while. And while before the events of today, there was some interest uh, of some wonks usually today. It's every basically every article about anything that has to do with the nuclear aspect of the current crisis is being read by hundreds and thousands of people every day. Um, and this is on the one hand good because it shows that the people are following, but it also shows how worried people about uh, all around the world are. And here also, I will allow myself a personal note uh, like Dr. Potter did. Um, I had celebrated my birthday just last weekend and my friends that visited me for the birthday party when they left, the one thing that they said is, well, we hope we can do this next year. And everybody understood what this was about. We hope we can come back not only for the hundreds anniversary of the Cuban missile crisis, right? But next year, will we see each other? This shows how much worried everybody is. And I think on the one hand, um, this is good, this public awareness, because at least in theory, it should create some pressure on our respective governments to act, to try to prevent catastrophic events from happening. On the other hand, it makes also things uh, more difficult uh, for diplomats uh, to try to work this out behind closed doors because there is so much trans transparency and so high expectations on uh, the information being given out to the public. And I would probably like to challenge uh, Dr. Orlov's idea that the two countries will be able to sort this out following their national interests, because I think that's one also one of the differences to 60 years ago. It's not going to be possible to such easily to find compromises. You give up on this, we give up on this, because you would have to sell this and explain this to the uh, broader public. So with this... Um, I will be very short and happy and looking forward if there is any discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much. I am I am now um also uh, very uh thank you. I deeply appreciated your honesty and frankness, and you really raised the bar high, I think, for all of us to really think about um, how important this meeting is and, and how uh, we hope this workshop will, will be very constructive.